How did you become an international spy? My Russian is there or thereabouts. It's, it's, it's rusty, but I can get by. You go into a bit of Ivan Drago mode, you know yeah, what I yeah. mean? Fast flowing intelligence, yeah. straight to people who are on the front line or making big decisions and saving lives. We're listening to communications, and if we hear a threat, and I wanted to join there and mm. then. When was it then you were in Iraq with Bin Laden, Saddam Hussein? Right, okay. So, room goes quiet. Yeah. Saddam walks in the room. The hairs on the back of everybody's neck. You just feel the evil coming off him. And they're trying to find out where his weapons of mass destruction are. Correct. And you were sent in to find that, all the information out about that. Is there any one point you, you provided some really good intelligence to get someone killed? Paul, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you very much, Dodge. Good. Very much looking forward to this one. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you become an international spy? Oh, I'd be telling, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, I'm a Ron the Valley boy. Mm. So I'm a Tom Jones sort of karaoke sound alike. <laughs> My accent is still there. I'm putting a posh accent on today for you. <laughs> I now live in England and have done for many a decade. <laughs> but ultimately, I'm a Ron the boy from the South Wales. South Wales Coalface. My yeah. family are from the mining sort of fraternity, and that's where I grew up. Mm. I grew up in Pontypridd. Nice, nice rugby playing. Yep, absolutely. Lovely. Absolutely. I was an egg chaser. Never, <laughs> never a footballer. <laughs> Quality. Never. What's um? What was what was what was the the moment you said oh, I actually want to get into the military? What was school life like? What was where, where was the point? You're like that's that's for me. Right. I remember in 1973. Four years of age. My mum and dad took me to RAF St. Arthur, Royal Air Force St. Arthur, and they had like a, an air show day there. And uh, I remember being there and seeing the lightning jet fighter taking off and basically going vertical with engines and afterburners and the whole ground just shook and you saw the flames and you just, I was like, wow. And then I went back to school that following week and you get your picture storybook where you've got a line page at the bottom and a picture bit at the mm. top. So I did a nice picture of the jet taking off and then I said, I see myself doing this job type thing and that's where it started so the seed was planted then mm. and in junior school you can be what you want to be yeah, can't you yeah, yeah. so when people ask you what you want to be I wanted to, I wanted to be an astronaut yeah. I remember my nana and granddad asking me that and they'd buy me books on rockets and on the planets and everything else and I knew the planets <laughs> and I knew solar system facts or factoids you know what I mean and it was a bit of a nerd really yeah. uh, but I had this thing then when I joined uh, secondary school I went through puberty early and I grew, my dad's like an extra from Game of Thrones, right? I'm 6'4". <laughs> my dad towers above me. Yeah. And when I was about 10 or 11, I had a growth spurt. And I was nigh on six foot plus. Uh -huh. uh, what is now, you go to year seven. Yeah. It was all form one before, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I was like 11, 12, six foot. Brilliant. I had feet like Pingu, right? I could lean at 45 degrees into the wind, right? And not fall over. <laughs> so you imagine, I was the youngest, like, I'm a June baby. So I was one of the youngest in my form. Yeah. I was one of the tallest beanpole gangly kid, <laughs> in, like a big puppy. And I remember getting on the school bus, to, to, to the big school. And I was excited about big school. You know, going to this school and you had, they, had a, they had a good gym, athletic tracks, albeit sort of a cinders type thing outside. They had a swimming pool and they had school trips to go skiing and you heard all these great stories. And then I got on this double-decker bus that like the old ones they had on the buses. Yeah. You know, you had the pole at the back yeah, type yeah, thing yeah. and you had the off sent drivers. The position. ones you jump on and that's jump it. off before you pay. That's the, yeah, that's the ones. <laughs> so we had these old school buses right, yeah. from Taff Ely Borough Council as it was in back in pont de And we had to travel like three miles to this uh, village called Beer there. It was up the road from where my mum and dad lived, where I lived. And uh, I remember you had a new blazer on, had a new satchel, you know, your brand spanking new, but mm. I'm standing out because all the rest of my mates, it's like living in Lilliput, they're all down here and I'm up there. Mm. And I get on this bus and you can smell cigarette smoke. And of course, I didn't know at the time, I wasn't street savvy mm. to the bigger kids because mm. I was hanging around with mates of my own age and everything else. And these other kids from different villages were being picked up. And I got on this bus and it was full downstairs. And I thought, oh, go upstairs. And as I got up this, up this spirally staircase, you could just... The, the cigarette smoke was really, really strong. And I got there, there was loud, a lot of noise, and it was smoking. I thought, oh, bloody hell. I could see a seat down the front with some other kids that I didn't know. And I didn't realize my mates hadn't followed me. They all stayed downstairs. So all of a sudden, I felt like, oh, what's that on my arm? And I thought it was like a, I felt like a bee sting. Well, some 
I had shoved a cigarette through mm. my new blazer and burnt my arm. Mm. I hadn't even got to my seat yet. Mm. And it's my first day. And then all of a sudden I felt something wet on the side of my face. And some other kid, they just spat at me. You know, and I'm thinking, this is not what I've experienced in my village growing up. It was a not small village. And, you know, we had uh, good friends. I'd never experienced bullying or yeah. physical abuse. Mm. And I got, I thought, I, the kid who spat at me, I went, sort of turned to him and I gave him a bit of a look type thing. Mm. I couldn't stand up straight on the upper deck anyway. And I sat down at the front of the bus and they left me alone. I think they realized that maybe I was simbering and they didn't want me to go too far, but they'd done their point. And I got off the bus at school. Uh, I hadn't been to the school before, went to the toilets and mates were there downstairs who hadn't followed me up and what's going on. And I was upset. And that sort of set the tone mindset wise for me going into that first year mm. where it wasn't cool to be clever. You had to play the gray man. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to do really well, but I laughed. I sort of lacked that self belief then. Mm. That I thought, my God, is this it? You know, what's the point? Mm. And I didn't really want to have that to come home and tell my mum and dad what was going on, because I had that personal pride type mm. thing at that young age. And you just kept it all in, which is probably the worst thing I could have done. Mm. And I didn't really excel at school then. You know? So, what made you then choose the military? Well, the military side of things, um, did my O levels. Did my A-levels, failed my A-levels. I got through on the old levels, the old GCSE mm. system. I did okay in the subjects where the teachers enlightened you and you mm. saw relevance in it. And you could see an end goal for learning those objectives and getting through it. And then I was uh, in this, during the A-level period then and people were going to university and choosing courses. And I thought, I don't know what I want to do. I want to see the world. Mm. I want to travel. And I was into my fizz and we lived on mountains and I put a rucksack on, put some weights in the back, mm. and I'd run over to my nana and granddad's about five miles, work out there, then run back. Mm. And I was I was watching programs on telly, like there was the Paris program mm. and there was other things about Marines and you'd watch it. And I was enthralled by it, but I still had this aircraft thing in my background. Mm. And I thought, I'd really think I could go into the military and do make something of myself, get a career going and see how it goes. Mm. And I went into the Army Careers Office in Cardiff, and it was a tri-service one, so it was Army, Royal Navy, and Royal Air Force. And I went in and I spoke to a few people, and the first person that was there that was available was the Royal Air Force Careers Desk. I remember this ginger-haired corporal behind the desk and goes, yep, yeah, yeah. So I sat down, I said, um, yeah, I don't know which one to choose, really. I said, I've got these qualifications, but I failed my A-levels. And he was really nice. And he went, right, he goes, um, well, what do you fancy? because they were recruiting right away across the board. I said, I want to go into the flying side of things. He goes, well, you've got a tall order there, pal, because ultimately you haven't got your A-levels. Yeah. He said, but you can go, you need commission to go and become a pilot. So you need A-levels and ultimately you need a degree. And I thought, well, okay. He goes, but there's another, there's another branch. It's called Airman Air Crew. What's it it's called, sorry? Airman Air Crew. Airman Air, 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 Air Crew. Air okay. Crew. So you, say you, do, you do the same sort of square bashing course. Yeah that all the rest of the basic recruits do. And then you do an additional seven weeks then at what was Royal Air Force Finningley. And then you graduate from that as a sergeant air crew. So mm -hmm. you have three stripes and a legal above it, that shows your air crew. And then you go on to your specialized training and you learn to do anti-submarine warfare, radar detection, load master stuff if you want to go and be stuff then on helicopters or on Chinooks, on Pumas, on wow. that type of stuff. I thought, wow, that sounds... Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Cool. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> so there I was. So yeah. I, I went away, did the selection bits and bobs, went to RF Biggin Hill mm. in Kent. Mm. And uh, some, luck more than judgment, actually got offered something. Mm. But when you're 19 then, right? I was just turning 18, 19. Mm. And I was going out with a girl and I was into my soul music. And I had tickets for a Luther Van Dross concert mm. in Wembley that coincided with me starting the Royal Air Force. So what does a 19-year-old sort Straight of to Luther. Straight to Luther. Mate. Absolutely. Now, I went there. Yeah. Subsequently, sort of, uh, it was a stupid spur of the moment thing. I was, I'm in an R in about, oh, do I really want to go that? I really like to go and do the pilot bit. And, yeah. You know, Top Gun was out at that time and mm -hmm. all that type of thing. And everybody wanted it. I thought, oh, is it really? And then I listened to friends around me who weren't military-minded. I was saying, oh, you don't want to be doing that type of stuff. You know, you're gonna, you know, I was working in Cardiff at the time mm -hmm. and, and he said, you're going to miss all this type of stuff. And I kind of listened to the naysayers. Mm. And, and I regretted it instantaneously. Within a matter of weeks, I thought, oh, for God's sake, you know, the relationship was just a neither here nor there. Mm. So, yeah, went to see Luther Van Dross, mm. and that was brilliant. Yeah. But 
Ultimately, I went back into the careers information office. Same ginger haired corporal was behind the desk. And he just saw me because I had to write a formal letter to, mm. to say, I'm sorry, I can't. Circumstances, yeah, da, da, da. He goes, oh, I'd like to sort of take that offer up now. And he went, you've burnt your bridges there, mm. mate. He said, you're going to have to at least wait another year and go through the same process and compete against people mm. who are coming in behind you now who are younger, may have better qualifications, may have more. And on the day when you go through selection again, they might shine better than you. Mm. He said, so lesson learned there, mm. isn't it? I said, oh, I, said I just need it. I want to get out. I want to get away from here. And I don't want to listen to the naysayers. I felt I was different to those mm. people that I had around me. Um, not necessarily my family, but uh, my sort of my friends, my friendship group, mm. shall I say, that I had. And um, he went, right, okay. He said, you're physically fit. He said, you're, you're, you're a robust guy. He said, you, you like your rugby, your athletics, your basketball, that type of stuff. Um, I said, what about a physical training instructor? He went, yeah, you could. You'd be a good PTI. He said, but there's something about you. He said, you, the way you describe things, you're very honest, you're very open. He said, you are articulate. You put yourself across really, really well. He said, uh, how are you with languages? I thought, where's he going with this? I went, well, I don't know, mate. I said, I didn't really like languages in school that much. He said, you want to travel, don't you? So you're intrigued by travel. I said, yeah, I actually record on VHS, wish you were here in the holiday program and watch all <laughs> Judith Chalmers. Good back, old you Judith. Know? And I'm there, I'm there with a fantastic yeah. tan, you yeah. know, and I see all these wonderful programs and I'd be there and if I was home and my dad was a copper then he'd be working shifts or mum was out mm. and I'd put these cassettes on, which is quite sad, they're looking mm. at the holiday program. I think most teenage boys would be watching porn, yeah. but no, I'm looking at <laughs> Judith Chalmers. And it's like, what the hell is going on here? So I'm watching all these places around the world, and it was Egypt and the Far East and all this type of stuff. And I thought, yeah, I'm intrigued by language. I'm intrigued by the culture, but I had a bad experience with language learning in school. He said, so would you say you'd be intrigued to learn a language? I thought, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah I would. He goes, I'm going to send you away for an MLAT test, which is, oh, what's that? Modern language aptitude test. He said, you go up to a place in Rutland, there's a base there. He said, and that's where we have our language school and then the applied training afterwards. I can't tell you much about this trade, he said, but you come out uh, as a junior technician, which is equivalent to a Lance Jack, Lance Corporal in the army. He said, and it's on a high pay band. He said, but on completion of that, you go to Berlin as your first tour. I was like, flipping hell. I go to Berlin, mm. live in Berlin. And mm. he went, yeah. He said, so you'd be on decent money. He said, you get qualifications from it. And he said, basically, spying mm. and I'm totally in Tom Clancy mode then straight away and I'm thinking I don't see this advertised anywhere why are you suggesting he says also he said I only know this from guys I've bumped into in the past but there's also a flying branch associated with it but you've got to be in to go that way they can't just take you off the street that way and into that onto that aircraft platform doing the airborne spook the airborne spy type thing so I was totally intrigued and I wanted to join there and mm. then so I went up to um, what was RAF North Luffenham in Rutland, did a few days selection up there. I had no idea. And they, they play you, you got your headphones on like this and they play you different noises and you're doing wacky word search things, looking for symbols. And it's a bit like where's Wally and you're looking at different sort of Cyrillic alphabet or sort of Arabic alphabet and you're sort of piecing things together jigsaw wise. And you have an interview and I said, yeah. They said, so and I was totally honest. Why you come to this trade? I said, because I turned down air crew. Mm. Um, and I was totally, totally, honest with the, the, the officers that were interviewing me. I said, but I'm intrigued by this. I'm intrigued by piecing things together, other cultures, travel. I said, languages, you're telling me I've got an aptitude for it. I said, I didn't realize I had. I had a bad experience at school, full stop. Yeah. And they were really understanding. And they went, right, okay. So what languages that do you it. speak today, fluent? Fluently, Arabic. Um, uh, my Russian is there or thereabouts. It's, it's, it's rusty, but I can get by. Yeah. And I also speak Pashto as well. So Pashto, Pashto I had to learn as one of the uh, languages in Afghanistan. There are primarily, uh, primarily two languages in Afghanistan, Pashto and Dari. And Pashto is the one I was taught. So after 9-11, I got whisked away on a three-monther. So it was a three-month language course. There were six of us that were chosen uh, from the UK. So from different uh, agencies as well as armed forces sort of entities. And we were mushed together sent away, learned Pashto really, really quickly from a, a native speaker. And then we were out. And then predominantly then what turned out to be Op Herrick and the different incarnations. What's of up, what's up Herrick? Op Herrick was the operation post 9-11 
it, it was the ongoing operations in Afghanistan. So it was called Op Herrick. And you had sort of, it went, it, it, there's many numbers every year, they went up a number basically. So all the way through until we pulled out of Afghanistan, there was Op Herrick going on in Afghanistan. So what age were you when it really kicked off for you? Was it 9-11, 2001? I would say, yeah, because my first language that I learned was Russian. That's, that's unbelievable. Language. Like you can go and just learn Russian. Oh well, it was. It, like, I know you're a really intelligent guy. I know you've played it down here in your it was a youngster and whatever. But you're a super intelligent human being. How easy is it to pick up a language like Russian? It's nails, mate. It was really, really nails. What I found, um, I was in a barrack block, right, and we were in a ten man room, and I was. Uh, when I finally finished the square bashing bit of the training and I went through, I was nigh on 20. And of course, I failed my A-level. So there was a, bear in mind, I've got a master's in cognitive science now. So I know how the brain works and yeah. elite performance and all that type of stuff. But looking backwards, mm. I didn't have much white matter going on in my head. And that's ultimately the broadband that connects different spheres of your brain. Mm. I didn't know how to learn. Mm. I'd sort of, the stuff that I learned at school at O level, the old GCSE yeah, standard, yeah. was stuff that I had the relevance. And it was taught in such a way by gifted teachers that I could get the point across. Yeah. And it made sense to me. And I retained that information, but I failed my A levels. I didn't apply myself, didn't study. So I'm in the military then. So the physical stuff wasn't a problem. Mm. Rules and regulations wasn't a problem. Cleaning this, doing that, running there, carrying yeah. this, not a problem. Yeah. Then when you're doing your lessons and you're in learning from native speakers again, you're in small class sizes. We had a class of about 10, I think, mm. something like that on my intake going through. And you'd have vocab every day. So loads of words every day. And you give a book and you'd look at it and you'd be like, A4 sheet of paper, a couple of sides. They start off with a couple of sheets and then it grows and grows and grows. And I'd be there in the barrack block, right? So I'd be sat on my bed. There's 10 little beds. You've got a, a wardrobe between you and a chest of drawers, and you might have a little desk. Mm. That's it. But the rest of the guys have come straight from A-levels or college or uni, and they've already got language qualifications. Yeah, okay. They can speak French and Spanish yeah. and stuff, whereas I can ask for a kilo of apples mm. and, uh, you know, ou est le syndicat d'initiative mm. type thing that I learned from French when I was mm. about 12. Mm. That's the only phrase I could stick in my head. And I didn't understand about grammar, didn't know what a verb was, didn't know what an adverb was, because I didn't pay attention in the English lessons mm. at school. What's an adverb? Well, this is it. You tell me. I mate. don't know. You know <laughs> You're asking the wrong quickly, person. Quickly, bigly. My boy, uh, my boy uh, comes back, Dad, help me with English. He's talking about nouns, adverbs. I'm mate, you ask, oh, ask no, your mum. I'm the same. <laughs> so I've learned, I've learned everything the hard way. Yeah. So when I'm teaching somebody now, You've it's, broken it down to make it easy yeah, for them. Yeah. I go to the lowest comment and all that. Okay. So you can build it up and build it up. Yeah. And it works really, really so well. So what I find fascinating is that you were in the military and at a young age, they want you to learn Russian. Mm. They want you to learn Afghanistan. What's it called? Pashto. 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 And what, what was Arabic? Is that what you spoke? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did you know what you were letting yourself in for when you were no. learning these languages? No. Okay. Not at all. It's like the big dangly carrot for me when I joined up. Bearing in mind, I joined up in 89, mm. right? So it was, uh, the Cold War had pretty much come to an end. Mm. You know, uh, you had Gorbachev uh, in power and everything yeah. else. And it was the perestroika stuff going on, et cetera, mm. et cetera. So the former Soviet Union is rebuilding. Uh, Mother Russia has sort of given back the satellite countries around it. Mm. So Ukraine, and yeah. Kazakhstan, and all the rest of the stands around there had their independent, their own autonomy yeah. to a certain extent. And then, uh, so Russian was being taught. And I thought, well, I'm going to Berlin. But you could kind of feel in the air that it was all... You know, it was all Europe and Final Countdown on yeah. on, 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 uh, on MTV and all that type of mm. stuff. And uh, you could see East and West coming together in a bit of harmony, really. So early 90s we're talking here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. So literally on my Russian course, um, the Berlin Wall came down. Mm. And then we were getting ready to do, we did a language training for just over a year. And then you go and do a separate uh, seven months of training, basically, six, seven months of training, which is your applied training, which is basically your spy training, yeah. but in layman's terms. Yeah. So uh, it's all well and good knowing a language, but when you're listening to something, you've got to know what they're referring to. Yeah, okay. So to use an unclassified analogy for this, it's mm. like 
if you're going to Halfords and wanging your car in for a, a service, exhaust change, mm. whatever, if you don't know what they're talking about, different components, it's just words you're yeah. hearing. Yeah. You're not hearing what the fault of your car is. Is there a bigger problem here if you're listening to the mechanics? Mm. So it's that type of thing. So you have to know lots of other sort of subject matter as well. So if you're listening to different things, you can make sense of it pretty quick and you can advise accordingly to mm. people who require that immediate piece of the jigsaw where was it in your journey where you were actually were like right you are going to be a spy yeah um the russian stuff i did when i graduated on the russian course and it was all you know i was i was utilized for a couple of years on utilizing my language skills so mm. i was utilizing russian and then i was selected to be on an Arabic interpretership. So the Russian level I was taught at was at linguist level. So you're talking, it's about A-level standard, yeah. which is a tall order to go from 0 to 60 yeah. and, and above that, you know. And I was taught Russian to be kind of passive because you're there, you're listening in. We weren't going to be behind uh, on East Berlin talking to Russians and everything else. Yeah. So our passive and my passive skills for Russian are still very good. My spoken skills, yeah, I can go in and put a Russian accent mm. on and all that. But you, know, so you start, you go into a bit of you go into a bit of Ivan Drago mode. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? So, um, so it's, it's with a Welsh pretty, twist, exactly. All right, how's it right, going? All right, all right, comrade. Uh, yeah, all right, so, but exactly. But um, yeah, it wasn't until I did my Arabic, and that was an eighteen-month language, pure language course, and that was the Defence School of Languages uh, in Beaconsfield, just outside. And London. what year we're we talking here? You've gone from Russian in the that, early nineties. When did you start learning Arabic? I started Arabic. I was selected for it in uh, ninety-three. Uh, but I was the first, there was a handful of us in the Royal Air Force that were selected to go on it before it was always the domain of the Army, of Royal Signals yeah. or Intelligence Corps. And for reasons various, they brought the Royal Air Force into it as well from our intelligence background. So uh, we, I was the first in the Royal Air Force to be on an Arabic interpretership without having done any Arabic before. So it was a, it, that, upon arriving in a Defence School of Languages, Arabic just lit my brain up. Really? Oh, absolutely. Did you find it easier to learn Arabic than learn Russian? Yeah, but there's a scientific reason for that as Go well. On. But I found Arabic a walk in the park. Really? I really, really found it wow. really, really straightforward. It was logical. It's phonetic. It's sort of, once you get your head around that, uh, it's a different alphabet, but so Cyrillic in Russian, right? Yeah. But my brain wasn't wired yeah, for okay. languages. Once I'd done the Russian... Because I finished, I started off a Russian course and I failed two mm. progress reports. If I failed the third one on the bounce, I'm recoursed back several yeah. months. And if I don't pick my socks off, I'm off. Mm. So I'll get remustered if they've got a space on some other course. So I mm. could have then go and become any sort of other trade who would have me then because mm. I've failed at this. What have you got slots in for? Mm. Um, but once you'd learned the Russian, the white matter, okay, your brain, right? My yeah. brain, if I kept my head open now, Pull my brain out. You've got a big grey walnut. Yeah. All right. That's your grey matter. That's your physical hard drive. But what the hard drive needs to have efficient communication mm. and learning ability is white matter. Yeah. Now, white matter is, is fats and proteins, basically. But they like broadband connective tissue mm. that grows around the head. But they send messages a hundred times quicker than just the brain on its own. Right. A hundred times quicker. Wow. So that's where you get some kids in school who are like, mm -hmm. yeah. and the other ones that got lights are on, there's somebody home. Yeah. So constantly, I've done lots of other talks and stuff. We'll probably chit chat about that mm -hmm. later. But it was then on the Arabic course when everything, it was like having an epiphany. It was like all of a sudden I'm learning a language. That you found I'm easy. Not Initially, you, you get you get initial sort of teething problems. Mm. But ultimately, no, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And it was just a joy. And it was so, and what's so good is, and you also spend time in countries. So I spent time in Jordan as part of that mm. course as well. And never been to the Middle East before. And of course, I'm a big, blonde, six foot four Welshman. Yeah. And people don't expect me to speak Arabic. Yeah. So when I'm going through, we were in a, a city called Zarka, which is their second biggest city outside of Amman. Yeah. And I'd be walking around there in the compulsory shorts and desert boots and stuff like that and a t-shirt and i'm walking around and people are looking at me like they they haven't seen a big caucasian person like me walking around yeah. and i'm smiling and then i'm going you know they're talking and they're going marhaba, marhaba. and i'm you know, saying salam alaikum which means how are you going mate and they're like 
oh, the photo, the photo, come on in, come on in. And, and they're getting me, and I'm sitting in people's lounges, yeah. and they're making me tea and coffee, and, and I can eat, and I can drink, yeah. and, and they love that. Yeah. You know, and you want another coffee? Yeah, I love yeah. another coffee. And you're there, and I was sitting in shops. I was, having, I, I was talking to everybody, and people were just thinking it was great because they had this Connection. Westerner. Yeah. And I was talking about stuff, and we were talking about things, and everything from freedom to freedom of speech to democracy so what's it like and i took postcards with me so i had postcards because we were in beaconsfield right so it's just up the road from windsor so i got pictures of windsor castle tripping of the color yeah. all that type of stuff and i was showing them buckingham palace and all yeah. this and they were like whoa wallahi wallahi you know this is amazing and i'm describing things and i'm showing my family photographs and describing my, you know this that and the other and they were like oh wow and there was more similarities than differences yeah so yeah, they might have been overwhelmingly, you know, uh, Muslims, yeah. uh, or whether it be predominantly Sunni rather than Shia. But you know, I'm a boy who's been christened, but I don't really. I'm I'm a humanist yeah. really, and I'm describing these things to them, yeah. and it's like, and they were getting it, mm. and they were like, oh well, okay. So get, gaining this language and having that under your belt, the two languages, in fact, the three languages. When was it then you were in Iraq with Bin Laden or Saddam Hussein? Where was it when you were sent out? Right, okay. So we were deploying. Um, I went onto the flying side of things. Mm. Uh, that was in 96. And so that squadron I referred to that, you know, you had to be in and then go across. I got selected, managed pass through selection for it onto the aircraft. But because I'd worked with the Army and other regiments beforehand mm. as well, your name is known. Mm. So when I finished on my Arabic course and I went to Cyprus and when I was work, when I was on my Arabic course at Beaconsfield, there were other guys coming through from uh, the regiment mm. that were on language courses as well, albeit shortened versions so they could get a bit of a taster and off they go deploy to the different four corners of the world, so to speak. Uh, so I was aware of them. They were aware of me. So therefore, when things were required to do other stuff and other deployments, they would request from my boss could they release young Hughes to go and do this, that, and the yeah. other? So that's what happened. So when um, the weapons inspection stuff came about in, uh, during the time of Saddam. So uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, yeah. there was a weapons inspection. Yeah, the United Nations, Nations had a special commission. The United Nations Special Commission, UNSCOM, it was called. And they're trying to find out where his weapons of mass destruction are. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. you were sent in to find that, all the information out about that. It had been it had been going on for a few years before I joined on to yeah. the teams, um, and then I got attached to the team as a terp, as an interpreter, mm. because of my language skills. And of course, uh, they need to have people who they can trust, so they can listen. So you're not employing a local to do it. You yeah. need somebody who's totally independent, who can actually. Who's on our side? Yeah, that's doing that. Okay. So what they found out from that, on my first day flying into Iraq. Now, I'd done operations around Iraq before when I was doing stuff with the squadron, etc. But when you're flying into a place that you've been monitoring, it's really peculiar because you kind of know it pretty well. Yeah. But you're there. And then you're, found, you're flying in uh, just to an airbase just outside of Baghdad. And then we had to go in and go through clear customs and stuff. But at that time, Saddam had banned Brits and Americans from being on the team because there was about uh, various violations that he was claiming, et cetera, et cetera. So he banned Brits and Americans from being on his team, did you say? For being on the weapons team. On the weapons coming team. In. He, okay. didn't, he didn't want them on. Okay. And then the next team in, they had me. Yeah. I'm Welsh. Yeah. So my UN passport, place of birth, Wales. So when I've got to then explain, but when I was on the aircraft going in, I, was, I had two other interpreters with me. I had a guy from Lebanon and I had a guy from Tunisia. And I thought, well, there's three Terps on this team. We're going in here. And we were just chatting in the back of the air, the Hercules going in. And um, my chief ins uh, inspector alongside me turned to me and said, Paul, I have an idea. He said, uh, how about you don't speak Arabic for the first few days and just, just see what happens? Because I don't think they're going to realize that you understand. I thought... Yeah, we'll give it a go. So we let the, the Arab nationals deal with the interpreting things and we'll just take it from there. So, of course, we land at the airport. We're going through customs and the guys are looking up. And I can understand what they're talking about. And then the guy goes, looks at me, and he's looking and he's looking up and everything else. And he went, Wales. 
And I went, uh, Sweden? And he went, huh? <laughs> Stamp. <laughs> Big blonde, didn't I? Quality, yeah. So I look like a Viking. <laughs> so he just lets me in. So I'm boom, I'm in. So I yeah. thought, oh, this could go wrong. I don't know. Yeah. I'm winging this a little bit here. <laughs> so that was my first kind of foray into sort of doing stuff on the ground, thinking about a seat in my pants type thing. Yeah. And then we, we went into Baghdad. And I remember and we had um, Richard Butler was with us, who was the overall guy in charge of the weapons inspection team. He's a big Australian guy, larger than life character. We all met up and we had to go into this briefing thing in their version of the home office. And we went in this brief and there's obviously big posters of Saddam here, there and everywhere, and ornate pillars and all sorts of stuff. And uh, we went into this big briefing room and I said, who's coming to brief us? And they went, oh, we think it's going to be Tariq Aziz, who's the foreign minister is going to be briefing us today. So therefore they're all running up. We're with that. Saddam walks in. Saddam walks in when you Saddam were... walks in the room. So we're looking, you know, there's entourage coming in, the room goes quiet and these uh, Republican Guard generals walk into all regalia, big chaps, mean looking people. And they walk in and at this sort of uh, top table type thing that they were going to sit behind with the microphones on. And we're there and I'm right at the back of the room and there's about 50 of us in there. There's the teams that are already in Baghdad there as well and where the new team has just come in. So we're there and I see they're coming out there. Hell fire. And I'm, kid you not, the hairs on the back of everybody's neck. Yeah. And Harry Potter wasn't out at the time, but when you see the scenes with the Dementors mm. whizzing around and everything else, and you suck the life out of the mm. room, you just feel the evil coming off him, you know? And it was, and he came in and, he, and it was really like, you know, we're there and we're in a cold sweat. And I can see seasoned guys in front of me and I can physically see goosebumps yeah. on them. And I'm thinking, Jesus, this is a whole different world. You know, so that was my first day in Baghdad, basically. So, and what was your? How long were you out there for? Oh, we varied. So we we, we staged in a, uh, in Bahrain and we flew in and then we shuttled back and forth to the halfway house. So the initial time I was there, I was there for I think it was two months. Yeah, and then you sort of you shuttle back and forth and do another bits and bobs associated with the overall mission because actually you're seconded to the United Nations then, so you're not actually UK military. Yeah. You are seconded to the United Nations. Mm. So you don't have any conflict with everything else. I was there purely. I wasn't, I didn't have any mission regarding spying, anything like that mm. at all. I was there as an interpreter. But as an interpreter, you interpret what's going on around yeah. you. It's more than just the language. Mm. So therefore, literally on day two, when we're going on our first inspection, we're trundling out somewhere. And we got the big white Jeeps with UN on the side and things like that. And we're there. And we had we had these guys that were with us. Uh, who are our minders, and they're called NMD, which stands for National Monitoring Directorate. So they were basically Saddam's henchmen, and they were trying to find out where we were going so they could tip off the people in front of us to move things, do things, and all that type of stuff. And we'd be going out to this uh, this site, and I think we were at some sort of educational sort of establishment. And I got out the back of the Jeep, and I'm sorting out some kit, and uh, I can hear these guys talking in Arabic. And they're talking about demonstration and they're talking about arranging it and they're talking about getting it sorted out and do it on the back and then bring the uh, the vehicle around the front and we'll move that out there. And I'm thinking, yeah, they're moving stuff. Yeah, They're actually moving stuff here. So, of course, it helped massively because like, I was just staying passive. I was just staying quiet. But understanding everything they're saying. But I was interpreting yeah. the situation, Brilliant. what was going on. <clears throat> so, therefore, that's how we went on from there then. So, it worked wonders. And mm. uh, it, it took him a while to realise that who I was, mm. uh, when they realized that I was a Brit, mm. <laughs> I wasn't Scandinavian, and the fact that I could speak Arabic, and we were flying in a helicopter, and um, we had a failure. Uh, the helicopters we were flying in um, were UN helicopters, they were Hueys, like ones you see in your Vietnam War yep. films, and they were on loan from the Chilean Air Force. We had Chilean Air Force pilots and air crew flying them, and uh, which was an experience, you know, mm. you see the Hueys, on war films growing up and everything mm. else. And all of a sudden you're flying over the Shia marsh areas in Southern Iraq with the doors open and you've got your feet on the skis yeah. and things like that. It's a peculiar sort of thing. But um, we were in the aircraft and we had a fuel pump failure. So we had, we had to land and it was during Ramadan and we have an Iraqi pilot on a jump seat alongside us as well, who's also monitoring the comms. And if he gets wind of where we're going finally, then he can sort yeah. of radio down and tell the <clears> teams on the ground from the Iraqi side of things where we're heading. And uh, we landed, and we landed at an airbase. 
And uh, there's a lot of flapping around us. They didn't want us to land, but we were coming in because we had a problem. We had to land. So it, it, it was a pan. It wasn't the Maydays, but we had to land as soon as we possibly could safely. And it was a minor fault with the aircraft and it was rectified in next to no time. Mm. But we got off the aircraft and I had this Iraqi major alongside me who was a helicopter pilot. And he loved himself. And they had this ground crew coming out to the helicopter and he was shouting at him. And he, he lit a fag in the in proximity of an aircraft, you mm. know, and all the rest of it, on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a helipad, basically, and everything mm. else. And he was a bit arrogant. And he's chatting. And I thought, oh, what's in that hangar over there? And... Uh, he said, oh, I don't know. Let's go and have a look. And I thought, this guy's dynamite. Mm. He just wants, he's just all bravado and wants to show off. Mm. And of course, we're, right, we're going across here and he's just telling these guys to get out of the way in Arabic and everything else. And um, as we get there, we can actually see this aircraft in the hangar. I could recognize the aircraft. I realized what was there. I could see that they had different bits and bobs on them. So it, it's sort of, you're using your skills then. Yeah. But we got back on the helicopter. We took off. And um, it failed again. And they were trying to, uh, the Chileans were trying to tell this Iraqi guy what they thought the problem was and everything else. And it's with a pump and this, that, and the other. And I went, uh, Madukha. And he went, he went, oh, thanks. You know, and I thought, oh, yeah. I've given the game already. Yeah. You know, everything else. And then we landed back in Baghdad. And I, I, I was on a, I got swapped over some different teams. And um, they went, oh, yeah, okay. Mm. Maybe we get you back at the back ring pretty quick, just in case mm. there's any repercussions here or anything else, or they say anything. But I was allowed back in. Did yeah. you have any times when you were on these missions where you were close to losing your life? Yeah. 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 Um, what we had, um, literally, um, uh, they, we, we stayed in a place. Our headquarters was in a building called the Canal Hotel. It wasn't a hotel, but it was the old Canal Hotel. And it was basically, it was an UNSCOM and also UNICEF joint buildings. It was a UN building with UN personnel in there. Uh, it was guarded by Iraqis. And, um, but of course there was troubles over there as well. And there was a lot of anti-Western sentiment. And uh, I've been in the cafeteria uh, one day, uh, just getting your lunch. And as I went out the cafeteria, went up the stairs, it was a thud. Oh, what the hell's that? Glass tinkling and everything else. And then there was a, another big sort of thud and people running out. And somebody launched an RPG through the cafeteria for the glass and smashed it. But the, the, the warhead didn't detonate. So it was more of a, it was a, I think it was a deliberate act just to sort of wobble us yeah. rather than to actual detonate. Mm. But it sort of brings it home then mm. that you're thinking, what do you know? You know, so I'm upstairs having my whatever it was stew, mm. goat stew, and sort of. Uh, I know. <laughs> so what was so back in Iraq? You got Saddam Hussein, yeah, fighting against Iran. Is that right? Well, yeah, they had. What the was ten- going on there, and why? Why did we want to be taking Saddam Hussein out of the equation? Was he just flaunting it, saying he's going to take on the world? He's going to put missiles everywhere and. Well, it sort of comes from the invasion of Kuwait, doesn't it? Because he wanted food. money from Kuwait. And the Gulf War, he claimed that that were, that the Kuwaiti lands were actually his, and Iraqi, and he wanted to claim that back. But there, in the 80s, you had the 10-year war. So Iraq was against uh, Iran, yeah. and, and there was chemical weapons used then, yeah. proven uh, by Iraq then. Saddam actually used them, and used them on his own people as well, against the Kurds, who were in the north of Iraq. And he's also used them against the Shia Marsh people in the south. So, uh, you know, he was evil. Yeah. Uh, so there was, we knew there were weapons that were uh, nasties, as we termed them, that were used there before. And um, but no, it was a difficult time. Difficult so what, time. Was your, what was your actual mission then? To explain to the listener interpreter. now. The I interpreter. Was, but it was your mission to go and find out what weapons he's got. Why would he allow the UN into his country? It was part of uh, a mandate that was uh, the UN Security Council started UNSCOM, United Nations Special Commission, with that very mission to go in and to show, to pr- for him to prove to us that he didn't have any weapons of mass destruction because chemicals had been used before. Why would he care? Because he wanted to have sanctions lifted off his country. He wanted to start existing and being seen on a global stage mm. and everything else. But the Western governments deemed that he had weapons of mass destruction or had sort of covert 
projects going on from everything, even to nuclear. So when you have something like that in close proximity and he's used chemicals before, is he going to ramp it up? Is it going to get worse? He had long range missiles as well. Is he going to launch like they had during um, the first Gulf War yeah. when they were launching Scud missiles and hitting Israel? You know, it you don't it doesn't take much to work out that yeah. all of a sudden you've got a tinderbox there for a World War Three yeah. apocalyptic sort of scenario, really. So the UN was trying to sort of say, right, we're going to come in, we're going to inspect things, we're going to, you know, we want you to comply so we can show things and then do it like that. And there was, of course, there was resistance. Yeah, you know, was it a successful mission? From a weapons inspection perspective, from what I know, um, yes, the people that were there were brought from all different all different corners of the world. So on the, one of the first teams I was on, we had people from Ukraine, France, Norway, New Zealand, uh, South America, North America. So we had an eclectic mix of specialist people who mm. understood WMD, weapons mm. of mass destruction. And... From what we, you know, we were going through, we were forensically going through the data. Uh, we were, when you all got boots on the ground, you mm. can't do everything uh, using standoff intelligence from collection, you know, signals intelligence, that type of stuff, electronic intelligence. You, you have to have boots on the ground because things can happen. Things can be moved around. Things can change. So we did find, you know, uh, there were weapons of mass destruction that were found there that were destroyed safely and according to different regulations. Um, I think what came out of it was when the war came after it, so when Telic occurred, Optelic, which was the invasion of Iraq by uh, Western forces, yeah. basically. What was that called? Optelic. Optelic, okay. Yeah. So when that happened and they went through and they finally got Saddam, remember that when they pulled him out of the, yeah. the hole, et cetera, et cetera. What year were we talking here when we got Saddam out of the hole? I can't even remember. But I was, was oh, hang on. That was 2003 when it Telic. 2003, okay. 2003. So, but, but he he was on the run for a little while. He was, he wasn't he? He was hiding away. underground when they got him. He no? was when they got him, yeah. Were yeah, you yeah. working closely with the SAS, SBS special forces to give them intelligence to go and get Saddam? <laughs> Not from a UN perspective. No, no okay. No, 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 no. No, the, the UN, you report to the UN, that's it. Yeah. So, no, I didn't do anything like that. Mm. But um, when I was doing my other role, when I finished with the UN, and you're sort of, you're collecting intelligence sends for UK PLC, effectively, for yeah. our military forces. So we're collecting, you know, this is no uh, trade craft being given away here, yeah. nothing classified that you can't get on a Korea's website. Yeah. But the aircraft I was flying on, you're literally hoovering up intelligence. Yeah. And then you're finding those nuggets of information that you need to pass to a battlefield commander yeah. that can then be disseminated, which ultimately saves lives yeah. and you know gets our guys out of harm's way and gives us indication of where things are. Mm. That's it. Did you enjoy what you did? Yeah. yeah. And how many years were you in total? 23 years? 23 years I did in total, yeah. And that's 23 years? Not all doing the same role. I was in the RAF? Yes, it was Royal Air Force. And that's yeah. what were you doing? How would you explain to the listener now what you did over those 23 years? Well, I went on to the aircrew side of things, and then for reasons various, I peeled off that and I was put into an instructional role. And uh, the instructional role encompassed special projects. And that's when you start dealing with the other guys from other regiments, uh, elite regiments, and you're doing all sorts of stuff. And then I was very working very closely then with uh, counter terror people in London after the 7 7 bombings, um, because again, we were having people who conducted the seven seven bombings. There was obviously linking linkages to terror organisations mm. that we were de already dealing with in the Middle East yeah. uh, and beyond. So we had a good understanding of that. So I was brought down then uh, to sort of assist with the training yeah. of the new recruits that were coming in for people working out of London and doing that type of thing. So that was. Uh, but that was interesting, uh, wasn't it? It was. It was great, and it was the first time I sort of went across and done stuff. Working with counter terror people and special branch type officers. I remember we were doing one training exercise and I was working with a, um, a dog handler, police dog handler. And the dog, you know, you see the dogs that they have, um, certainly the special forces dogs, they tend to be all Belgian Malinois, yeah, Belgian shepherd right. dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they are mega brainy, yeah. you know, they're super intelligent. They just, and aggressive. Oh, no, it, yeah. God, oh mate, you've yeah. got to be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it turned up, we rocked up at this place and I was in. It's the South Kensington area. And I met my mate and uh, this this new colleague I was going to be with. And I'm sort of showing him things of what I'm doing uh, from an electronic intelligence background, mm. et cetera. 
And uh, then I'm obviously doing stuff about basic things about Arabic and how to identify uh, people that I can see spot as possible bad ones, yeah. wrong ones, you know. Yeah. And um, so we met and we were met in this, in this sort of coffee shop. And I was expecting to see like a Malinois or something. I saw this guy and I thought, well, that's him there. And I looked and he had a pink lead. And at the end of this pink lead, it was an apricot miniature poodle. <laughs> So I'm there going, this is a, this is a wind up, isn't it? You know, so I looked at him and I went, mate, is that your dog? You're holding it for somebody else. Is the proper one turning up yeah. in a minute? He goes, no, mate, this is Trixie. I went, hello, so this dog's like a circus dog. He's yeah. up on his back legs and wants a fuss and everything else. And I went, oh, hello. I went, seriously, that's a police dog. He went, yeah. He said, poodles are really clever, mate. Yeah, they are. I went, okay. Yeah. I said, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. I said, my nana had a poodle. I yeah. said, yeah, yeah, I can remember. He was switched on cookie, yeah. but okay. I said, but a bit obvious. He goes, no, it's too obvious, isn't it? He said, it's, it's, it draws attention to itself, but people don't think. That's a sniffer dog. Yeah. So I went, all right. So we were doing some bits and bobs. We had training exercises going on. So we had new recruits that were doing stuff in that environment, police people and all that type of yeah. stuff. And I had some of my guys from my team uh, that I had. I, I loaned down to London to do a few uh, jobs and mm -hmm. training jobs with them. And we were doing basic dicking, which is reconnaissance, and you're following people and doing things, and you're sort of you're hoovering up intelligence regarding those roughly guys. what roughly what year are we talking now this is after this is after seven seven so that was what that was about 2006 i was down 2006, there, I okay yeah, okay yeah. so i was down there then and uh what was funny was we were we were outside a rather well-known store okay in knightsbridge mm. and um the exercise was going on in large crowds and that's what you want you've got to follow pe people in a crowd and doing all sorts of stuff and it was exciting it was it was, it was useful for me because i hadn't really done some aspects of that working with the police before this different sort of terminology and things like that anyway my mate had to go go, go and take a jimmy riddle mm. so i'm left holding this dog on a lead right now i've not seen this dog work yet uh it's sort of we're a day into what we've been doing and i'm just walking around with this dog looking like a gay couple mm. all right which is you know we you've got this guy there's this dog which is rather effeminate we've got a pink lead yeah. you know and we don't look uh, we're both big guys, but we don't look suspicious. You yeah. know what I mean? We look part of the London scene. You know what yeah. I mean? You know what it's like, mate. And um, so, so I'm there, and all of a sudden, we had um, an Arab family walk past in sort of uh, ladies in their burqas, fully veiled, and a gentleman out front walking in front, as is the norm. And as these ladies walk past, this dog went bonkers. So it's barking. It's looking up at me. It's spinning around on its back legs. And I'm thinking, hang on, this dog's trained to sniff out all sorts of bits and bobs. Mm. It's going nuts as these go past. So tensions were still quite, you know, it was rather recent after 7-7 seven, seven anyway. So we're, we're there and I'm thinking, hell, hell, what am I doing? So I'm sort of on the radio calling him back. I said, mate, you need to get back here. Something's, something, something's brewing here. This yeah. isn't right. So he comes running back. And uh, he said, mate, what's going on? And I told him, and you can see him looking at the dog and everything else. He went, oh, mate, you know what that is? I said, yeah, mate, I've, I've still got eyes on, mate. They're still over there. I said, but I want to know first and foremost what that tell is, what the dog is doing. Mm. He said, mate, this, this could be really, really serious. I was like, oh, well, right, you tell me then. He said, that dog needs a shit. <laughs> and I, I said, you what? I said, you winding me up? He said, mate, you're on the pavement. <laughs> I went, yeah. He said, the dog's trained not to have a shit on the pavement. It wants to go in the gutter. I wants to find a bit of grass. So if she's giving you like, a five minute warning, I, now I'm going to blow you. So get me off this. I went, I said, so what are they doing? Is, is there a tell for the, but he goes, yeah, yeah, but it's covert. Yeah. So the dog will do a quiet tell. It's not going to bark and yap when someone's walking yeah. past you. It's going to give you a little nudge, yeah. so to speak, you know, and then sort of go over there, mate, you know, not spinning around going, I need that shit, you know. So, it's, so yeah, so yeah, you know, it's not all, you know. How, so. when, you were, when you were doing that in London, obviously the height of everything going on in in 2001 and then 7-7 seven, 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 seven bombings and terrorist attacks yeah. happening, what were you looking out for? What sort of, what sort of are you looking out for in a terrorist? Back then, because we're talking what fifteen years ago, mm. sixteen years ago. Yeah, you're looking. You're looking for a needle in a haystack, really. But what you find is, is that the people that we were getting 
in the UK at that point that were being investigated for possible links to extremism, extremist acts or planning them or Googling them, that type of stuff, you know? They were very, really, really inexperienced. They were wet behind the ears. They were So if they're going to be doing something, the way I look at it is that when you see it in one of the Bourne Identity films, when they, I think you're in Waterloo Station and the guy starts moving and moving quickly and shifty and all mm. the rest of it, it stands out. So everybody else in London is sort of in London mode, isn't it? Yeah. You know, head um, down, head down yeah, nothing yeah, else. Yeah, you know, yeah. you speak to somebody on a tube and they shit yeah, themselves. Yeah. You know, it's literally, so if you're looking for somebody, if someone's dicking around all the time, literally as in moving their head, looking, checking for things, looking for CCTV, mm. looking for things like that, you can spot, you can spot them mm. and they stand out. And it's like, if you're looking for a new car or whatever, if you're looking up, I don't know, uh, Toyota Yaris. All mm. of a sudden, you start noticing Toyota Yaris mm. wherever you go. Mm. If you always see a Ford Mustang everywhere, mm. if you're looking for Ford Mustangs, if you're looking for somebody who's looking suspicious, that's looking for a CCTV camera or other things that can sort of give away their footprint, mm. they stand out, and you can spot them. And the norm, but you got to find, you got to work out that pattern of life, what that pattern of life looks like on a daily basis. Mm. So you need to be, that's where you get good Bobby in and the cops are telling me things. Mm. So I was learning from them. They were saying, you know, when you got good Bobbies on the beat, know the lay of the land. Yeah. So if they're walking around in wherever part of London, they know who the players are. Mm. They know what's going on. They recognize faces, they know behavior and all that type of stuff. So I learned a lot from those guys as mm. well. Like I did the stuff from my time in the military at that point. And it was like an overlap then doing, working with the counter-terror a lot yeah. as well. And we were then doing stuff with them and we'd bring them up and we'd put them in flight simulators and show them from a, a flying a plane perspective. But who in the flight simulators? The security officers security, okay. from, from London, yeah. people like that and other agencies and government departments. And we'd, we'd get them in and we'd break it all down as in, you know, uh, basically showing them how 9-11 was done. And, you know, and people think, you know, we can all remember, close our eyes, we can see those, those, awful scenes yeah. in New York and the planes going in. But ultimately, when you're flying a plane, how quite straightforward it is when you mm. know the very basics of things. So it's good to put that in people's minds then so they can understand the risk and that when you're doing a risk management matrix type thing then for an event yeah. and you're, you know, you're with the Bournemouth Sevens and mm. stuff like that, you know, you've got to put in a risk management yeah. matrix basically and yeah. says you've got all these things covered and everything else from an insurance perspective and all that type of stuff well we've got to do that from a, they go, the government then created a thing called center for protection national infrastructure cpni came on the back of all this and basically they advise about counter-terror to everybody who has a an establishment or a, a contributes something yeah. to uk plc and that's where it's grown out of that so after the 7-7 bombings I think UK has done really, really well. Yeah. And you've got, you got the JTAC, which stands for Joint Terrorist, Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre. Yeah. Uh, they're in London as well. And they are really, we, I, I think we do it really, really well. I was just about to say that. Do you think the British do it better than anyone around the world? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, okay. Without, without what doubt. intelligence, I think counter terrorists and everything. Yeah, I think, you know, you read about um, the Five Eyes community and I've heard it on the podcast before you guys have been talking about mm -hmm. it so that's you know the America UK Canada New Zealand and Australia after the Second World War it was these English speaking countries basically that got together and said look we're not going to get caught with our pants down yeah. again let's divvy up the world from an intelligence perspective we'll collect it on these countries you collect it on these countries yeah. and then we'll basically share our intelligence at a decent level so if something's kicking off over here we'll tell you if something's happening for a gun to affect us mm. and vice versa mm. so that's it ostensibly what mm. it is so um i'd say from a, the five eyes really have mm. it off pat you know they really have it done how quick are the met police when something happens in london with a terrorist attack very rapid mate yeah. Really rapid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's been a lot of slagging of the Met and everything else, but the, the encounters I've had with Met Police and the stuff I still do yeah. um, involving Met Police, I can't fault them yeah. personally. Uh, they're very, very industrious. They uh, they care. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a beast in itself really, isn't it? And you're always going to have a cultural change and things like that. And the whole London is changing in front of your eyes all the time. You know, uh, as, as it is around the country, full yeah. stop. You know, you have different matrix, different people coming in, immigration, things like that. People adjusting. The world's in a bit of a, 
in a bit of a turmoil state. Yeah. It, it, it's it's in uproar at the moment. I went to London last week, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Took my little nine-year-old boy there, my wife, and we took him around Big Ben. We took him into all the sort of the, the big wheel, the uh, London yeah, Eye, yeah, etc. Yeah. Westminster Bridge. I felt, as a Londoner, going back to London, I felt really uncomfortable. Mm. I was on Westminster Bridge. It was packed of just tourists. Big Ben, packed. London Eye, packed. And I just had this thing about me looking around going, anyone could pull out a massive machine. Yeah. Anyone could set off a bomb. Anyone could drive through the crowd. It was just a really weird, weird feeling. And mm. maybe I'm overthinking it, but I just didn't feel very, very comfortable whatsoever. And that's a Londoner going back to London, which is your hometown. But mm. I didn't feel like it was my hometown, I've got to say. And I was quite glad to get out of there. No. Not to, just that, just those moments around those tourist areas, you know, that something could just pop off instantly. Mm. It was, it was heaving. And that's why I asked that question, how quick, like, if something did happen, how quick a t counter terrorist old bill would turn up? How long would it take them? You've got teams on standby all the time. So you have, they're you? ready to rock and roll, yeah. Yeah, but you can't, you can't account for a lone wolf doing something like that. Yeah. A van, you know, the car ramming into a crowd type thing, somebody pulling out a machete on somebody. And things When's like the that. last time we had, you know, when people wrap around bombs around them, the old suicide bombs yeah, yeah, stuff? yeah, yeah. I had a guy in there called Roy Lana who, uh, who fought off the suicide bombers on London Bridge. Yeah. Great, proper hero of a human yeah. being. And he tells his story. When was the last time we've had anything like that? I don't want to speak too soon. I'm touching words and whatever, but mm. it seems to have gone yeah, quite quiet, um, quite quiet over the last f good few years. Mm. Do you think that's all been put to bed or do you think that could just pop up at no, any time? It's not put, it's not put to bed. It, it, it's a sign of, if you listen to any of the talks done by... Uh, the, the head of MI5 and uh, you get routine sort of talks and saying that we've had, uh, we have taken care of X amount of sort of planned attacks that were yeah. there ready to rock and roll and they've been taken out basically. Yeah. So we have got a really good system in place, but you can't account for everything. And ultimately there will be things that will get through and it's hard. It really, really is hard. It's Doesn't hearts it, and minds. Yeah. Hearts and minds is key. Yeah. Um, and I think what's key from our perspective is and what I know from the stuff when I've done, when I've been working in Baghdad, working around Iraq, working in different areas in the Middle East, which are black flag areas. The black flag areas are ones which are usually Shia. And they're normally up for a bit of a jihad, of a bit of a personal strife, uh, personal uh, sort of mission. That's what a jihad is, really. It's not always meaning a political uprising or military sort of uh, sort of mission or anything else. It's a it's a personal uh, sort of goal to get better. Mm. And uh, is that what a jihad is? Jihad is, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you've got to get it in context. Yeah, okay. So if somebody says oh, I'm on a jihad, a jihad could be go. I'm going to the gym three days a week. Right, okay. I'm on a diet. I'm doing this. Sort of, I've you know I've given up chocolate. You know, giving up chocolate for Lent. If you're a religious person, I you wonder know, if you asked hundred so, people in the street what a jihad. No, they'd go to them. straight away. It's military. It, yeah, it, goes, it, it would be a terrorist yes. related type yeah, thing. Okay. Someone's going to come and go. Yeah. Bang. Boom. And that type of thing. So it's not. Mm. You got to take it in context. Um. What are your thoughts on police in this country <clears throat> and the government knowing that there are terrorists on the streets and still living in our country? From what I, from my experience, um, I can't go into the whys and wherefores and everything else, mm. but our intelligence systems are the best in the world. Mm. So... I'm not saying that we've taken care of the situation for good. We haven't. It would be, it would be silly to say something like that. But we're probably in a really safe country yeah. right now, or as safe as it can be. Mm. Um, so that's the solid. So as a, as a dad yourself, you know, mm. when you go into London with your nine-year-old mm. boy, and I'm the same. You know, we're, my kids are all grown up now, but I remember giving them. Uh, <laughs> you can say it to my youngest daughter, you know, she was I don't know about ten. And we go shopping somewhere, and, um, and she'd toddle off with her, uh, a brother or a friend or whatever. I'd give her a rendezvous point, an RV point, and also give her an alternative RV point. So there's not many dads that tell mm. their kids, you know, <laughs> just if in I, case. If we don't meet back here outside yeah. Claire's accessories, yeah. all right, at this time on yeah. this bench, there might be 
a bit of a crowd. There could be something. Yeah. If that's the case, then meet me outside there. Mm. If I'm not there, but every half an hour after that, go to that point, wait there. Yeah. So it'd be further away mm. from the actual center, so to speak, mm. but with plenty of cameras and everything else. So I, I've taught that to my kids since they were little. So they still do that now. So they'll always have an alternative <laughs> RV yeah. and basically- Where things. were you on the day of the Twin Towers Oh, the planes crash into Twin Towers. Okay. Uh, I just come back from an exercise uh, the day before and uh, I was home on leave and I was fitting a kitchen, okay. uh, making a mess of it. Mm. And then uh, I remember my wife coming in and saying, we've seen what's going on. And I didn't know because I had my CD Discman on with some good tunes and my headphones in mm. and I was beavering away doing kitchen stuff and put a telly on in the kitchen because we were quite posh and we had a telly in the kitchen and put it on and you get all the, you know, you could see it. And then I got the phone call straight away, pretty much my boss to get back into work, having a brief. And then in the next to no time, I was away on my Pashtu course. Wow. And that was it. It was that quick. Wow. It was that quick. And then from then, what about Bin Laden? Osama bin Laden. Yeah, yeah. What was going on with you, yeah. Osama bin Laden, and happening around that well, time? Well, straight away, the Pashtu course, you know, the way we were briefed by my boss at the time, he said, right, there's, you've been selected, you're off on a Pashtu course. Um, and, and Pashtu is Afghanistan. One of the languages in Afghanistan, okay. yeah. Mainly for sort of the southern states, really, yeah. and then sort of around Kabul, Kandahar, Helmand province, that sort of stuff. Um, but it was the language that a lot of the senior Taleb were using, senior Taliban sort of officials were using and conversing in. Um, so we were told that, we were told our mission was, um, we got to find the jigsaw pieces that get Bin Laden. Yeah. That was our, that was why we had to learn it three months. Quickly. So as quickly as possible. The guy that was instructing us was a former Taliban doctor, believe it or not. He was coerced into the Taliban. Uh, he lived in Kabul and his family had a farm. Uh, now Kabul, if you've been to Kabul, I've been there many times now. And um, Kabul is surrounded by mountains. And through the middle, it's got a mountain range as well. And you've got Baba Gardens in the middle, and you've got a little sort of uh, valley that goes through that connects basically the two sides of Kabul. And uh, my instructor who taught me, his family had a farm in the middle, small, small, small holding basically. But the Taliban came on to his Taliban slash Al Qaeda elements because they were pretty much smushing together at that time. And they came onto his farm, his family's farm, and basically squatted and took up the space and said, yeah, you know, we're here now and uh, we're going to set up and use your facilities and this, that and the other. And uh, my friend and colleague who was teaching us, he was a doctor in a hospital in Kabul. And they realized he'd come home every day with his doctor's bag and everything else. And they said, you're now our doctor. Okay. So he basically, you don't say no. Yeah. So he was dealing with sort of amputations, gunshot wounds, usual sort of things, you know, that they were experiencing over there. Uh, but he had a major issue with that. He didn't agree with the Taliban. He didn't agree with the Sharia sort of way that they were going to wanted to do things. And eventually he managed to escape to the UK. And he escaped via the Red Crescent, which is like the Central Asian version of the Red Cross. He came to the UK. Our security operators realized he was coming because of the Red Crescent alerting him. Yeah. Speaks perfect English, speaks Arabic, speaks Dari, speaks Pashtu. Obviously a qualified doctor as well. And so when he taught us Pashtu from as quickly as we possibly could, he also put stuff in our heads about the culture and also about the mindset of a Taliban operative, of an Al-Qaeda guy. The Al-Qaeda guys weren't always Afghan. The Al-Qaeda guys were brought in you know, during the 80s, uh, in the early 90s, you had the Mujahideen. Mm. The Mujahid is a follower of a jihad. That's where the root of the actual mm. word comes from. Jihad, Mujahid. Mm. So Mujahideen is the plural of that. So you had a lot of Mujahideen coming from different Arab brethren from around the world that were coming to fight to get rid wow. of the Soviet Union out of there in the 80s. And of course, when Western and NATO forces are there for what was Obherik, they were fighting against them as well because they wanted out. They wanted those heartlands to be basically their citadel for their new Sharia law. They wanted to have their own 
sort of caliphate, really, mm. which the Taliban have now, mm. but the Al-Qaeda elements were attaching to them and trying to get and doing their training bases there, etc. What's the difference, explain to us, what's the difference between a Taliban and an Al-Qaeda? Right, Taliban, Talib uh, is a, a religious scholar. And when the Taliban was founded, the Taliban was founded to oust the... Uh, Soviet Union in the 1980s. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, yeah. you had an uprising and then you had this uh, new group called the Taliban. That's when they came to sort of fruition. And at the time, the Western governments perceived them to be a, a force for good because they were ousting the communists out of the country and they wanted this, that and the other. And uh, they so on, initially, and they were supported, if you read books on this, etc. And I've read a lot of books on Taliban, supported by CIA, supported by other agencies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, providing there were different weapon systems like a Stinger, uh, which was a surface to you know, a, a, a basically a missile system, a man pad system. And um, so, who was supplying these to the Taliban then? Well, different agencies, <clears throat> different agencies. CIA were in there providing them, so American really? and CIA were passing uh, weapons in. And <clears throat> what you tend to find now is there's always proxy wars going on. You know, so you don't. What do you get, mean by that? A proxy war <clears throat> is like you don't get, thank goodness, uh, you don't get a state on state war. So you're not getting uh, UK against Russia. Yeah. You're not getting United States against China and everything else. But what you tend to get are these other battles that they then use, it's like Russia using Wagner Group yeah. in, okay. in Ukraine. Okay, so I they're using it. different people to Little do their dirty work for okay. them. Yeah. So what you find then, you have the Taliban pushing former Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, but they're then being supported and funded, which is well documented in books. And Osama bin Laden is Taliban? Osama bin Laden, no, Osama bin Laden is the leader of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, okay. So he's, a Saudi, he's from Saudi Arabia by birth, yep. from a very, very wealthy family in Saudi Arabia, but he was pretty much uh, the rogue child, effectively, who went to the extreme side of things and wanted the... Al Qaeda and the sort of an Islamic caliphate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the difference between Al Qaeda and Taliban is what? Taliban is predominantly Afghanistan. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's there for Afghanistan. It yep. was there to sort of fight in Afghanistan yep. and to get rid of the Soviet Union. Yep. And then the Taliban then morphed. And then you can imagine when the, ta the tables are then turned, all of a sudden the people <clears throat> providing support to the Taliban change. Change, okay. So all of a sudden they're no longer in favour with Western government. So you're going to get other governments coming in okay. and providing weapons to them as well. So it's again, it's another proxy sort of And Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda, they're pretty much, they're still in existence, but they changed and morphed now, so they're not the power they used to be. What came to fruition after Al-Qaeda was ISIS. Yeah. So it's basically, it's like, uh, it's funda funda fundamentalistic uh, franchising. So it's from the same people? They came from the same, they got a similar kind of belief wow. system. And Al-Qaeda is what country? Al Qaeda isn't a country. No, no, I know it's not a country, but where are they from to build up Al Qaeda? They come from all different um, Arab heartlands, really, okay. or uh, Islamic heartlands, really. And those same ones, that same heartlands, there is that's where ISIS was born. Yes, wow. pretty much. And you've got Al Qaeda wow. at the moment are very strong in Yemen. Yeah. So uh, that country is still fractured. Uh, because of troubles there. So you've still got a very strong Al-Qaeda base in Yemen, which is next to Oman, and obviously at the bottom tip, southern tip of Saudi Arabia. Wow. So it's it's a complex subject. Mm, it very. Really, really is a complex subject. So you so go just going back to your RAF days, were you flying planes? I was flying in a plane. In a plane. So I remustered across to the flying side to air crew. So you do do some flying training. So you do like a right-hand seat course. So you learn how to fly. Yeah. You learn how to sort of do the navigation and all the yeah. rest of the stuff. But ultimately, I'm in the rear of an aircraft and I'm listening. Yeah, okay. What sort of mad planes have you been in? Oh, Christ. Have you been in everything? No, not necessarily. You said you mentioned Hercules earlier. You mentioned oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Pumas. Oh. Tell, tell, me what, tell me what's out there. Oh, crikey. Uh, you, know, you name it. In the Royal Air Force Infantry, I've probably flown in it. I even had to go in a fast jet, so I've been in a Hawk, which is one of the Red Arrows type things. So that was that was, that was fun. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you've done all the transport stuff like Hercules C-17, A400M, which is the Atlas, which is a capable aircraft now. So I've done, all that. I've done a lot of stuff for the Americans as well, so I've flown in them. Um, my favourite is a Chinook. I love a yeah, Chinook. Brilliant, you know the old Waka Waka. Yeah. So that that that. Uh, and so nice. tell me, tell me your world today, Paul. What's your world today? This has been a fascinating story of what you've gone through well, there. Guarding the spying world. Before we finish off, yeah. 
Did you, is there any one point you you provided some really good intelligence to get something over the line to get someone killed? <laughs> uh, yeah. But I won't comment on that. Mm. But yeah, that was the job. That was the job. You're identifying, ultimately, we're there to save lives. Mm. So if we've got our forces on the ground or we're... We're listening to communications, and if we hear a threat, we've got to let that person know there's a threat. So by that, by doing that, we've saved, you know. And I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here because my old squadron and the other regiments that I've been affiliated to, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're still doing their jobs today, and they're brilliant, they're a talented bunch. And when I went on to those into the into that into the squadron, onto the different regiments and things like that, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Who are people who have gone there before and they're showing you the ropes and you get taught in a way that is relevant and you get it and when you get it and it's not um it's an environment as well in the military you find where you can share information and even if you're a newbie you can share that with somebody who's senior because you might see something or realize something or grasp something and what i found when i first went on to the squadron that i went on to i was one of the younger sergeants on there uh, and I was the only sergeant, I think, that went on to there that hadn't done the Berlin tour before. I was like the new first of the new bunch coming through that hadn't done that Cold War bit mm. of working on the ground in mm. Berlin and all that type of stuff. So it was a different kind of thing. And and then all of a sudden we had this thing called asymmetric warfare, they call it. So it's not like a state on state thing. You've got these little skirmishes going on and you need fast flowing intelligence yeah. straight to people who are on the front line or making big decisions and saving lives. Mm. So that's ultimately what we're in. We're in a saving lives business mm. and um, getting it right, getting it right with zero collateral damage. You know, you're sort of, it's, it's tight. It's Fair really play. Tight. Fair play to you. Yeah. And I know there's some stuff you can't say. Oh, this. <laughs> everything I've said just now <laughs> it's been a nightmare when I said oh, well, I'll come on this on, on the podcast and I thought holy hell so I've had to speak to people yeah. with clearances and yeah. everything else and, uh, and and say can I mention and they can go oh, yeah you can <laughs> but I said well that's been documented in this book oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah I can see that yeah. but you know you don't give away any SOP standard operating procedures yeah. technical capabilities Yada yada, mm. you know, and I, everything I've reiterated here, the stuff you can read in books that have been published, or you can get it on careers websites. Mm. How would you describe what a spook is? A spook. Well, I heard spook for the first time when I was I was flying with the U.S. Navy, and I did a little stint with them, doing the same role as what I was doing in the Royal Air mm. Force, and I was working with the U.S. Navy guys, and they went, "Oh man, you're a spook." I was like, "Are you taking the piss here? You know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. A spook. What's a spook?" Yeah. You know, and they went, hey, man, you're like an airborne spy. Yeah. You know, it spooks at me. Seventh son of a seventh son. It's like it's something written somewhere stupid, yeah. you know. And I went, I ain't got a clue what you're talking about, mate. He goes, no, basically, we call ourselves spooks. Spook, yeah. Anything else. And then not long after that, they had spooks on BBC. Yeah, that's and right, that yeah. was all MI5 type yeah. stuff. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it became regular sort of parlance yeah. in the UK that, oh, if you work for MI5, you're a spook. Or if you're doing stuff regarding spying in the military, you're mm. a spook. Mm. You know, so that's how it started. And what are you doing today for a pound note? For a pound note, I've been out now, I did 23 years in the military. And for the last 12 years, I set myself up. Um, I was signed to age 55 in the military. So I could have stayed on longer. I could still be serving now. Uh, but when you've done everything, and I've been doing the special projects, bits and bobs, and working with uh, other regiments, et cetera, et cetera, and the counter-terror stuff. And I've always had an entrepreneurial sort of kind of spirit to me, and I've always wanted to try new things. And I thought, I'm going to be repeating myself um, if I go down that route again and yeah. go and do this and go and do that. Uh, so I set myself up as a limited company. And at that time, it was a thing called becoming an interim manager was all the thing. And you get 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 paid a good daily rate and you go and do a consultancy stuff. So I thought there was defense consultancy I can do. I was qualified uh, as a forensic engineer mm. as well. So I did a master's on that type of thing before I left the military. So I was all clued up on mm. that as well. And I could do a daily rate on that also. And I thought, oh, I'm, I was doing the talks as well. I was going into schools before I left. The veil of secrecy got list, lifted off what I was doing, and we could say that I could, I could speak these languages, and I've yeah. been there and done that without the, giving the game yeah. away. And I went into a into a a pru, which is a pupil referral unit, a borstal, for want of a better word. And I did a talk there, and I did a talk in a few other schools, and the kids really got it. Mm. And I was there, and I'd go in in uniform. I, I, I was a chief instructor at the time on a base, uh, doing the special project sort of scene. 
And if I wasn't doing uh, training, etc., and then I, w- I had a bit of downtime, then I would go and do a bit of extra stuff in the community. And I'd go and do a talk. So I'd go into this post, I'll do a talk, go into the schools, do a talk. And ultimately, I was talking to naughty boys and getting them to realize that actually learning languages is cool. Mm. It isn't all about, you know, buying your kilo of apples and asking for directions and mm. stuff. Because what you're doing, you're formulating this white matter in your head, mm. 100 times quicker, yeah. thinking, da 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 So when you've got your super fast broadband in your head, mm. you can apply that to anything. Mm. So I've subsequently gone on and done that with elite athletes. I've done it with rugby players, professional footballers. I've done it with, uh, you got one of the guys I'm working with now. So you got Liam Byrne, who's the yeah. British wingsuit champion. So we're doing stuff with Liam. Yeah. And it's all about being the best person you can be, yeah. but cognitively. Yeah. And that drives everything behind mm. that. All so, about the mind. People don't think about it. Oh, no, mate, it's basic. I grew up, it's all about that mind, how powerful you could make yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, what do they say? I think the mind gets used only 10% of what oh. actually could be used. Well, the thing is, people <laughs> get, if you get into a routine, yeah. the neuroplasticity, so the way your brain grows and adapts and connects this new white matter to different parts of the brain, if you get into the same routine day in, day out, and you're in Groundhog Day, yeah. you don't grow any new white yeah. matter. It grows like wildfire when you're a toddler and you start, you know, when your kids start growing Learning. and touching things and yeah, moving yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. It grows like mad. And then when you're in school, if you're stimulated in school, and you're hungry for, for knowledge, mm. it works well. But if you're getting bored and you're not seeing relevance, you get stale. Yeah. Like I was yeah. when I left school. That's why I found Russian difficult first. Mm. And all of a sudden, the penny dropped. They had that euphoric sort of epiphany moment when they go, I can do this. I feel clever. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I get it. Yeah. And I haven't looked back from yeah. that. So several master's degrees later, yeah. I've got the learning bug. Mm. You know, I don't sit home at night watching EastEnders and soap mm. operas and stuff. I'm actually learning. If I'm in a car, I'm on, I've got my Audible on. I'm yeah. listening to podcasts. I'm listening to learning different bits and bobs. I'm always on the learn now, mm. you know, Same. regarding all sorts of stuff. Interesting, so isn't you, it? You've got to go for it. Yeah. So for me right now, I set up this limited company thinking, oh, one of them will take and I'll see. How, I'll just see how it goes. Mm. Suck it and see. Well, 12 years on, I'm still doing the same thing. Yes. So the forensic engineering I'm one of the leading forensic engineers in the UK. Yeah. I now specialize in automotive stuff. So I get sent all the nasty car crashes that people mm. can't really solve and piece back together again. I get sent that. So I'm getting uh, bent metal jigsaws. Mm. I get the data from the ECUs, from the computer control units and all that type of stuff. And I piece it all together again. So I work for insurance companies. I work for legal fraternity, for credit hire, and for also police forces as well. They utilize wow. me doing that. So that's one of the strands. Mm. And then I do the talks. The talks are now morphed, so it's still doing the language. I still fly that flag. Yeah. I'm, a ch- I'm a fellow at the Chartered Institute of Linguists in London. I do routine talks down there. I do talks at University of Cambridge, I do talks at other universities around the UK, getting people enthused about being the best they can yeah. be. And you haven't got to learn it to a high level of language. You can just get by colloquially, mm. but that helps with the white matter. That yeah. helps your clarity of thought. Your speed of thinking gets rapid, yeah. really, really rapid. And I'm, I'm a living version of it. I'm highly dyslexic yeah. and I've got ADHD because I mm. find it really hard sitting still here mm. today. You can probably see me. I'm going a mm. bit with my hands. That's, cetera, why we, that's why we swapped chairs. We had wheels on this chair, didn't we? <laughs> well, get him on while there's a system. I'll be moving around. I'll be spinning around all over the place. But they're not, they're not a disability. And yeah. so many kids these days, you get your uh, you get your certificate in school that says you've got a special mm. educational need. Mm. Well, I didn't even get pointed out in school mm. that I had well, None of us knew. Yeah. None no, of us knew. I don't even t- know now if I'm dyslexic or ADHD. No, you probably are because you're very gifted, very entrepreneurial, and you're straight to the point. Mm. Now, we're having commas back and forth. Mm. We're rapid, aren't yeah, we? Very. We're just dealing with it. We're yeah. getting to the salient points and we're getting it there. On WhatsApp. Bang, 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 done. bang, bang, bang. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, go yeah. around. And yeah. what I found, I've done a work, <laughs> I recently worked with a charity for about a year. I had my missus, my missus had a kidney transplant. Uh, I had a pretty much a year out of just treading water and sort of, uh, so the forensic stuff still ticking over, but I downsized a lot of my stuff. I thought, right, let's see how she is. Let's stay home and local. And I was working uh, for uh, an EFL club, League One club, Lincoln mm-hmm. City Football mm-hmm. Club. And I was working with this, the charity wing of them. And I'd gone into like a nine to five role, you know, and they do great stuff, but I just couldn't Not fit in. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. just, it's just, and, what you tend to find with dyslexics and people with ADHD, we're so quick with ideas yeah. and going for it. Is that what it is, is it? And you're just on it. And How and, do I find and out? And if you fail, if you fail, you fail fast. How do I find out? 
you can get yourself screened to certain tests and stuff. How do you find you ADHD, do. dyslexia? How do, where yeah, do I go? Yeah. Can you go well, somewhere? Can yeah, you? I've got as an mate, adult. I've got a mate who's a professor who uh, does all the neuroscience stuff, and he's got the same as me, and he's highly qualified, and he deals with kids who have special educational needs. Mm. Andrew Whitehouse is his name. He is an absolute hoot. And he's Put a gift. me in contact with mate, him. Mate, you'd really? love him on here. Yeah, okay. But, um, uh, but it's really funny because he's dyslexic and ADHD. So when we're having a conversation, we can talk over one another, mm. And in military, you call it duplex. I mean, two comms mm. going on at the same time. Mm. So I can be talking one subject. He's answering, but talking mm. another subject. So it's really mm. high speed, crazy. Yeah. And anybody from the outside looking in, it's like, what the hell's going on My here? missus tells me this all the time. She's like, but you oh, think yeah, something else, you think something, you bang, 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 I'd bang, say, bang, bang. I can't make that qualified yeah. judgment, but I'd say from looking at you, uh, what, you, what you tend to find as well, right? So all the blades I know, all the SAS guys yeah. I know, they are. Yeah, okay. Without a doubt. They're all guys that are, extremely intelligent yeah really get it they're mega alert always on the go uh get relevance in something really really quickly so uh, they, they're all got it so mm. uh, what i'm saying is a trend here that the achievers and the ones that are going there they have those traits mm. they have a dyslexia they've massively missed in school mm. too boring yeah. They need to be boom, boom, boom. I need boom. to be tested. I need, you need it, mate. You <laughs> need it. it won't make Everything you're talking about here. just makes me go, oh, yeah. But define normal. Well, I don't define know what normal is. Define normal. No, what is you know what I mean? So I, what I found, I started excelling when I started being me. Mm. So in the military, you do. And I found it. And I found for the first time when I joined the military that you get in. I got overall best recruit when I first joined. You know, out of 240 people on a flipping intake. And I got overall mm. do for it. And that's the first thing I ever won in my life. Mm. I thought, how the hell do I get that? Because mm. I was just being me. Yeah. And then you get, a, and I was very, very fortunate in my entire career that I had people who were very understanding for various things that I went through and all the rest of the stuff. But they they realized that I was working. My, whatever role I did, I did to the best of my mm. ability. Mm. And I was always coming up with new ideas. I was always being entrepreneurial mm. when you're inside a business mm. doing it or inside the military. And I was seeing up things and things that were saving money, saving, saving people, saving lives ultimately. Yeah, yeah. And then when I came out and I was working for me, of course, things were just, it was just, I was following loads of different ideas. Yeah. Things are working, getting on hunted for God's sake. Mm. I was working, um, Billy Billingham's on tour at the moment. On his first tour, I was helping Billy. I was his director. Billy's coming on, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking yeah. forward to that one. Oh, mate, you'll have a hoot. Yeah. But sounds a pound guy. Husey, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on today, to listen to your eventful life. Thank you very much. I've loved it. It's gone really quick. It seems like about five minutes. It does, minutes, doesn't mate. it? It does. Mate, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure to hear all of that. I know there's certain stuff you can't mention. Yeah. Um, and I massively respect that, but I've really enjoyed this. Thanks, mate. You're a gentleman. Cheers, bud. Good man. Cheers, Thanks, Paul. Mate.